morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode with Reinforce the Horse. Today, we are here with Shelby Dennis, and Shelby Dennis is an IAABC certified equine behavior consultant with hundreds of hours of schooling in equine sciences at the University of Guelph. She has loved and been around horses since the young age of four and offering professional training services for the last six years. Her horse experience is well-rounded with experience showing Arabian horses competing in humper, hunter, jumper, and dressage arenas, along with galloping race horses and restarting OTTBs, rescue horses, and even wild horses. Welcome, Shelby. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. So yeah, that was a short introduction. Would you like to go ahead and expand on that and maybe share a little bit about why you're here today? Yeah, um, well, so I, I've been riding since I was four years old. And when I started getting into horses, I started out working with Arabian horses and then started showing on the Arabian horse circuit. Um, and my intro to horses, I had trainers that exemplified pretty harsh and punishing methods to me, but uh, it was like a bit of an echo chamber. So I didn't even realize that it was unusual or not necessarily unusual, but I guess bad to handle horses in the way that I was having shown to me for so many years. And when I started to kind of move out of the Arabian horse circuit and moved out of show barns, that's when I started to kind of recognize that there was something amiss in what I was being taught around horses because when I moved my Arabian out of a show barn for example and put him out on 24-7 turnout with other horses there was such a clear and distinct difference in his behavior even while making no changes to training that it solved a lot of the behavioral problems that he had that were bothering me and when I saw it like shown to me that plainly I really couldn't ignore it and that's kind of what started jump-starting um my desire to go into like equine sciences schooling and what reaffirmed that even further was when I got my rescue horse Milo from the SPCA because he was a horse that like I couldn't use the methods that I was taught growing up on because they were it was all escalating pressure and punishment and I wasn't really taught how to handle unwanted behaviors without punishment and the more I tried to recycle what I had been taught over the years the more problems I started running into so it really exposed the holes in so much of the training that I had been shown by professionals. And then that kind of started me on the journey of exploring equine sciences courses, um, enrolling at Guelph University, and then taking the equine science courses and ending up specializing in behavior because the more schooling I did and the more access to studies that I had through the university, it just got more and more obvious how much misinformation there is in the horse world. And it started to get really like uncomfortable to put like the trust into trainers in the same way that I used to. So I kind of d dove into my education um, and used that in place of like putting a lot of money into learning from instructors. Like I still did lessons here and there, but the prioritization for a lot of like my adult life was the schooling because there was definitely a lack of trust in the information that I was being given by other professionals, especially if they had no formal education. Um, and I think like the reason why I'm here and why I've done what I do on my pages now is that the horse industry is so poorly regulated. There's really nothing to stop anyone from saying whatever they want, presenting it as fact to people who don't know better. And then they end up creating what could be years or decades worth of problems as this person recycles their information. And it can put people in really dangerous situations and it can also damage horse welfare. And I guess over the years, I've become really disenfranchised with a lot of the industry because of that, because it's just straight up dishonest and unethical in a lot of ways. And it shouldn't have taken me being able to afford to go to school and like put myself into student debt to learn all of that. But without getting that context, I don't think that I would have had access to any role models that would have shown me that or I would have had to look very, very hard for them. So that's kind of like the gist of my story and like the change in my horsemanship because I did 100% start out as someone who used um, traditional training methods that were really pr punishing and high pressure. And it wasn't until I started to recognize how flimsy those methods were that I really started to make changes because 
it's not sustainable to use training methods that may work on some horses to the detriment of their welfare usually, but then will put you in danger with other horses. So I wanted to find a different way of doing things. And the further I went down that science-based training path, the more I realized how much safer it was making me and how much more successful it was for modifying behavior of the horses. Tell us a bit more about Milo. Let's kind of hone in there. And then I think that's going to uncover a bit more discussion about your transition. Yeah. So Milo, I adopted from the SPCA here in British Columbia when I was 18 and he was two years old. They had him listed as like a a yearling though, because he was so emaciated when they rescued him that he was like incredibly growth stunted and looked like he was a yearling. Uh, But when we had the vet age him during his vet check, we found out that he was actually a year older than what they thought. But basically his start to life was that he was kind of bred irresponsibly. Like these people had a stallion and they had him out with like a bunch of other horses and he was just breeding. And then unfortunately they were not feeding their horses. So Milo was like a 1.5 on the body scale when he was rescued. And his presumed to be dam was like a one on the body scale but she was like heavily pregnant so they weren't even sure how that was going to go with the pregnancy and then they also rescued the stallion um and all the horses ended up being like rehabable and the mare actually had a healthy pregnancy surprisingly but after they put a few months of like rehabbing him to a healthy weight they offered him for adoption and at that point i was coming out of a situation where my off the track thoroughbred gelding that i had he injured his stifle and like it had rehabbed but I wasn't convinced that he was going to be like sound for jumping so I ended up sending him up north to Squamish British Columbia up in the mountains to a really lovely home that just uses him as a companion and a trail horse and he's still there almost a decade later so it was like a, a really good decision to have him there it's an awesome home um But after that, I was looking for a new horse. And like what I was actually looking for was a horse that I could start working with right away, like a four year old or something so that I could start um, preparing them to hopefully show the following year in the jumper ring. And I came across Milo's ad when I was actually sent like the stallion, who's likely his sire that was rescued from the same place. And his ad caught my eye. And I I don't know, there's something about him, even though he is way younger than what I was looking for. I messaged GSPCA and I wanted to book an appointment to see him. And then when I saw him, he was really curious, really, really nervous of people, but like extremely curious and a really nice mover. And I liked the look of him and I just had a feeling. So I filled out the adoption paperwork and I got him and he arrived to the place that I was boarding at like probably like an hour or two late. So I don't think they could get him in the trailer. But um, basically he was a really highly intelligent horse, but highly, highly sensitive and Things that I took for granted in my other horses, such as being able to catch them easily, being able to put a fly mask on, being able to handle their feet. He couldn't do any of that easily. Like putting a fly mask on him for the first time was a, it was a hassle. And then like introducing him to the hose was a hassle. And with the amount of pressure that I had been taught to train with, the way that I went about it was like the worst possible thing. And all it did was escalate his behavior like he would quite literally like square up with you if you tried to keep pressuring him and he'd be like okay come at me like I'm gonna come get you and like be rearing and striking out so within like a couple days of having him I realized that the way I was doing things wasn't gonna work but it was like only after getting so frustrated that I was like I do not want this horse anymore and I was like mom I don't want this horse anymore I know he's my graduation present but like he is pissing me off um and she's like just take a few days away reset and she worked with him for a couple of days and then I came back with a different mindset and then started to also do my own education on the side and the reason why I had to turn to like schooling through the University of Guelph is like the vast majority of trainers like even years after I first got him that I tried to work with with that horse were always like his behavior is bad he's being naughty he's being disrespectful he needs to be put in his place and it was all like the worst possible advice because like the few times that I did listen to people like that and they're like oh like smack him with the crop or something he always escalated it never even for a second stopped the behavior like 
he always would become more explosive or he'd shut down temporarily and just stand there and refuse to move. And then if you kept at it, he would just explode and be extremely dangerous. So it was just very obvious that what I there, what I had learned wasn't going to work on him. And he, in a way, was like a wake up call that I needed to change my training methods because there, there's quite literally no way I could have successfully trained him using the level of pressure and like punishment that I had used. Like it would not work on him because he would just continue redirecting all of his anxiety, frustration and stress onto people by like biting them, like lunging, striking, rearing, bucking, you name it. He would just he, he'd cycle through all behaviors that he could and just get louder and louder and louder until you finally stop doing what you're doing. So he was very uh, he was very successful in getting what he wanted because he didn't put up with a certain level of treatment and it started to increase the level of expectation and patience that I had to have, even if it was a ever learning process, because I've had him for nine years now, like it's been a long time. And even as I started developing him with lighter methods and kinder methods as a youngster, I still pushed him like way too hard when he was like four or five, six, seven, and then it ended up catching up with me later. And then I had to give him three years off to come do a full hoof rehab, transition him to barefoot because we'd really damaged his feet with the shoeing practices that we did. And um, now he's coming back into work um, after rehabbing all of that. And he's much, much better than ever before and like actually looks younger now than he did like six or seven years ago. So it's been a learning process for me on so many different levels with him because there's so many layers to like the training, the management, the hoof care and like the full body response of the horse that I've had to kind of learn from and experiment with him. I'm curious, what is your training method? Like, how did you go about training him after you had the wake-up call to change your training methods? I did start using positive reinforcement, but I definitely didn't start out using as much as I do now because I didn't really know how to. And I was also kind of still stuck in that mindset where people were like, oh, like you'll teach him how to bite and stuff. So I used a lot of like non-escalating pressure and release and like I like I couldn't escalate it past a certain point because if I did, it would just end up in me being in a position where he's coming at me. So I like in the beginning when he was two, we took him for like a lot of walks in hand and I took him on little trail walks and then we'd work with him in the arena and stuff. He didn't really like being worked with in the arena. He didn't like lunging. He didn't like anything like repetitive and boring. So for most of his education as a youngster, it was like honestly walking in hand on trails and like um, doing like liberty work and working with him in his stall and paddock, teaching him how to tie. And then when I did start riding him too, I did a lot of trail riding with him as well because the arena work, he was just always more difficult. And I think part of it was the fact that he got bored. And then like also like when he's bored and he's stressed, he would just serve to find outlets in that area because he's not as fixated on the environment changing around him. So it was pressure and release for a lot of it. But then as I started to do more and more schooling and really started to like get a good grasp on op operant conditioning, I started to have a lot more conflicting feelings about using so much pressure and release because I like looking at it from like a behavioral science perspective, I asked myself, I was like, what incentive is there for him to like this work? Like, what incentive is there for him to actually enjoy and want to do what I'm asking? And I couldn't answer that. So that's when I was like, okay, I need to add something to make this way more reinforcing for him in a way that he actually wants to seek out. Because like, when you break it down and you look at like how negative reinforcement is actually applied, anything that you're removing to reinforce the behavior, it by default has to be something that the animal doesn't like because otherwise removing it wouldn't be reinforcing. So if his only incentive to work for me was me removing something he didn't like, what emotions would that have associated with work? And it wouldn't be good ones. So um, I started to use more and more positive reinforcement, the more schooling I did. And like I started when I took advanced equine behavior and did more of like the in-depth stuff, it really, it was kind of like a light bulb moment where it really like clarified the direction that I want to go in training. And just as an important caveat, like I'm not against negative reinforcement, but I think that the extent to which it is used in the horse world doesn't serve any of us if we want our animals to like the jobs that we're giving them. 
because there's no incentive for them to like the jobs if there's nothing being provided that they actually like. Yeah, to me, it's a yeah. lot like uh, parenting. Uh, yeah. Children. Alyssa, you're almost an adult, and growing up, it's like I would have to look for areas in your life. If I just came at you and said, do this, do that, force you around, like we would not be sitting here together right now by any stretch of the imagination. And so I personally see a lot of similarities just in the way that parenting human children comes along. And then also these horses, they're two, three, four times the size of us. And it just seems like it, it makes sense to figure out what makes yeah. sense a little bit. It totally does. And I think the parenting thing is an interesting thing to bring up because I think that's also feeds into why some people are so like vehemently against positive reinforcement. And I think that a lot of it comes down to the fact that they probably weren't treated nicely when they were learning. So they've like developed this mindset that like you shouldn't be given reward or reinforcement for doing things that like quote unquote need to be done. And then I think that gets carried over. Like, and also the way that we work in like society and how it's built is like a lot of like the incentive to go to work to pay bills is negative reinforcement because if you don't work, you don't get the, what you need to live. Um, so it's interesting because. I think it is a lot like parenting, but then I think also like how people were like, even if it's not their parents, because their parents could have brought them up in a really rewarding way. But if their trainers didn't, then it makes that facet of their lifestyle way more predisposed to punishment and harshness and stress. And that was something that I found, too. Like I was like shamed for asking questions by trainers i was made to feel like embarrassed when i'd mess things up if the horse was bad sometimes they'd blame me for it if i wasn't willing to discipline the horse how they wanted me to they'd tell me that i'm going to teach the horse bad habits and it all came back to them deflecting their own incompetence onto me and blaming me for situations that they as the professional put me in and then that led me to kind of adopting the same behaviors and the same type of mindset towards horses. And when you grow up watching someone take out their impatience on a horse repeatedly, you start to default to those behaviors as well. So even though my mom didn't really parent me like that, I still developed those behaviors within the context of the barn because that's what I was having modeled to me by everyone around me. And if you resisted doing what they wanted you to do, you would get pressured into doing it anyways. So there wasn't really, you, you didn't have the ability to really say no uh, in the way that I might have wanted to at that age. And it was also really hard to be younger. And like, even if you aren't that much younger than them, if they're the perceived professional, then it's hard to argue with someone like that too. So yeah, it's like a hierarchy sort of yeah. like they sit at the top and don't disrespect the hierarchy. It sounds exactly. a lot like a, milita like a militaristic environment where you just have this sort of drive to do it this way or else. Yeah. It's and like, don't ask questions. Just do. Yeah. Sure. So what comes to mind when, when you're saying all this is perhaps at the core, there's a level of trauma, both with the human and the horse. I Does think so. On that? What I've noticed is that the horse world seems to have a higher instance of um, abusive behaviors, both towards the animals and towards the people. Uh, and like there, there, there's abuse everywhere in society. So this isn't to say that it's like specific to the horse world. But what I've noticed is that it's far more common to meet people who have ha run into problems where their coach has been emotionally abusive to them or in some cases like physically um, or where like they've experienced racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, any type of like bigotry and hatred and discrimination uh, or even just like elitism where if you don't have as much money as everyone else, you're treated as a lesser human being. And that that's probably the biggest one, because I see that literally everywhere. Even people who do not think they're being elitist are oftentimes being elitist in some capacity. Like, for example, the entire notion that in order to be a good rider, a respected rider and to deserve an opinion on topics, you need to have a show record. Literally, the only thing you need to have a show record is money to be able to get into the show ring. That's it. 
showing is just a, pl- a venue to show off your skill that you have to pay to go to. So the idea that showing is a necessity in order to garner respect in the horse world is an elitist mentality that I think permeates into so many other areas of the horse world. Because as someone who grew up with a family who had money and I was able to show a lot, like I know what it was like when they were able to support me in doing that. And my ability to do that was entirely reliant on my parents being able to afford it. Um, but what I learned when we ran into financial trouble and I no longer had that is like suddenly I, my opinions didn't matter as much. My trainers didn't like me as much because my parents weren't paying them as much. And I started getting treated way differently. My peers started treating me way differently. And now as an adult, despite the level of education that I have, if I'm speaking out on people who are competing at like the Grand Prix level, they'll be like, oh, you've never competed at that level. Let's see your show record. Like, who are you to talk about this? And it's like, well, who are they to talk about equine behavior? Who are they to talk about equine welfare? I'm not arguing the fact that they can get around a course or get through a Grand Prix dressage test because I know they can, I can't. But why are we deferring to people like that's opinion over areas where they are lesser experienced simply because they're in the show ring? And it, it, it's an interesting mindset because it, yeah, it all comes back to hierarchy where we're using these perceived status symbols to place people in positions of power that aren't necessarily deserved because of their experience. And for me, when I was showing the most, winning the most, I had the worst horsemanship. And it's not saying that showing and bad horsemanship are correlated, but the only thing that was putting me in the show ring was money. And Even if you don't own horses, if you have enough money, you can lease a horse, you can buy a horse, you can pay for lessons, you can pay for tons of shows, and you have the freedom to do that. So it's interesting because this entire world we've built in the horse world seems to have a lot of toxicity and weird ways of measuring people's talent and expertise and their worthiness. And I think that's why we tend to have such a high degree of like mental health issues and like trauma and people who have toxic experiences. Cause I really don't know if I know of like any horse person off of the top of my head who does not have a bad experience where they've had a really toxic barn experience or training experience or something. It's interesting that you bring that up. It sounds like it's largely about the person like the horses don't get much credit at all and especially I mean I've never been I've never showed I've never been to a horse show so I don't know how that's like at all but from my you know experiences with just horsemanship in general it's all about the rider like it's not it's not about the horse it's not you know what does the horse want to do? What does the horse feel about this? Does the horse even want to be ridden? Does the horse even want to be showing? Uh, it's it's largely about, I mean, like you mentioned, the money and uh, and the people. And, and then we're kind of made to coexist with these thousand pound beings that ultimately don't have a choice. Yet they are living and breathing. They are beings. And I feel... I feel like they deserve a choice in their life. Oh, for sure. And I, what I find particularly interesting about that too is that if you listen to what horse people say, like their justifications often contradict each other. Like one of the most common excuses I hear is, oh, if the horse didn't want to do it, they wouldn't do it. And then on the flip side, when their horse starts not wanting to do it and you're in a lesson, it's like, get after him. He's being naughty. You can't let him get away with that. And it's like, okay, but I thought if he didn't want to do it, he wouldn't do it. And now when he's telling you he doesn't want to do it, the entire rhetoric in this lesson is now about making him do it because you need to teach him a lesson. And logic like that is very prevalent in the show world. And unfortunately, it, it it's it's usually human issues because it's a lack of ability to self-reflect and look inward and actually look at what our actions are saying at face value because most horse people aren't willing to acknowledge that and the few people I've had the chance to bring that up to when they do it they get furious like they get so mad when you point out the contradictions and logical fallacies and cognitive dissonance and I think the reason why you get such visceral reactions is because deep down they know there's some level of truth to it 
And as someone who used to do that to people, when they said stuff I didn't want to hear, I would have denied that at the time and be like, no, that's not true. I'm just mad because you're saying like untrue things. But no, it was true. I was reacting like that because it there was some truth to it and it struck a chord. Whereas now when people come on my posts and they're like, oh, positive reinforcement is so stupid. You're just like a clicker, Karen. Your horse is a pasture pup. Let's see you get into the show. And it's like, I don't value myself off of any of that. Like people can say whatever they want about me and that they can say that clicker training never works, that it's not effective. And it's like, I don't care because I know what the truth is. Like I know which method is coming out on top in all of these animal behavior studies. And I know what I have seen work on top of that. So I don't get the same reaction. But the reason why I did in the past is because I couldn't substantiate my belief system. And when it felt attacked and I didn't have a response, the only response I had was to get mad. Yeah, I totally can hear that. And it seems to me that the core of what we're talking about is a disconnect with humans with themselves. Yeah. And and we can probably find similarities of these types of things permeating pretty much any interaction we have interspecies wide now for us it it seems very much more prevalent in the horse world because we kind of live and breathe horses yeah yeah um but at the core of it i what i'm finding is that we as humans have such a huge disconnect from what our own internal feelings are and how we deal with and you said it yourself how we deal with that inner inner self and then that turmoil internally comes out externally and sadly in the case of horses it's often the horses that are subjected to that um like it's interesting that you say that because i would say like one of the big things about like behavioral science discouraging use of positive punishment is that it suppresses behavior and then you're not dealing with the underlying motivation and what i find with people is like from the start of going into like the public school system or honestly any school system it doesn't really matter if it's a private school you're taught to suppress behavior because if your behavior is disruptive to the class or if it's not what the teacher wants or if it doesn't fit the mold of what they're teaching or if they don't know how to deal with it they move to suppress it and that's something that I experienced a lot growing up too. So I learned to keep a lot of my emotions stuffed down into myself, which didn't allow me to actually know what I was feeling sometimes. Like I remember when I started developing anxiety as a kid, I never talked to anyone about it because one, I didn't know how to label it. And two, all I knew it to be was like, it was just this weird feeling that I didn't like the feeling of. It was a weird feeling that came about and I couldn't figure out what it was connected to or why it was happening. But I knew that it made me feel viscerally uncomfortable and that I did not like it. And if it was more normalized to discuss emotion and discuss the underlying motivations under uh, behind behaviors and normalize like the emotionality aspect of people, I think that it would have been easier for me to first of all come to terms with that and learn about it before I hit like almost adulthood because it wasn't really until like high school and stuff that I started recognizing that. Um, But even more so after high school and university, like when I studied behavior for horses, it kind of was like a light bulb moment for myself, too, where I was like, okay, wow, this all applies to people. And there is so much crossover between human psychology and animal psychology. I've studied both of them, animal psychology way more. But like the crossover is insane. Like it's very, very similar. There's a lot of similarities when we're discussing like emotions, behavioral suppression, like when you suppress behaviors too long, how if you go over the threshold and it's a big outburst and that's where you see people having tantrums where they're losing their patience, where they snap at people. It's because they're over threshold and they're suppressing emotions. And they're not releasing them. And that too leads to people then taking it out on their horses because As soon as I started kind of going down the road of like behavioral science, like I found out that I was way more able to temper my own emotions, practice more patience and self-regulate better. And in turn, that allowed me to help horses do that better because when you're extremely agitated and you don't know what to do next, even if you're not outwardly reacting and doing anything to the horse, they can feel that energy like rolling off of you and it makes them feel unsettled. And For me, now that I have kind of managed my anxiety better, when I'm around really anxious, like, 
keyed up people who are angry or frustrated. Like if I'm in close proximity to them, I hate being there because I can feel the tension in the air. And horses are even more sensitive to that than people are. Um, And it's something that I've noticed like in working with humans and being around people too. There's certain people who I can feel like like bad bad vibes, I guess, is like the simplistic way of putting it. But it's like you can feel their emotional turmoil when they're trying to bury something that is trying to bubble to the surface that they can't keep down. Uh, I personally believe horses are innate empaths to the nth degree. I, I feel like they are, are largely empathetic and... They, Mirrors of us. They, they yeah. show that a lot. I just wonder if just being around horses and being open to the types of things that you're describing, if that ultimately helps us develop and fine tune our own empathic nature. I think probably. Yeah. Like I have ADHD, so I already have like high emotions and like a like problems with emotional regulation. So like working with horses from a young age, I think definitely helps me because helped and hurt me because when I was taught how to take out my frustration on them, that was a bad thing, but it helps me manage my ADHD in a way that I don't think I would have been able to, um, because I wasn't diagnosed until adulthood. But it's interesting that you talk about horses being highly empathetic because that kind of goes back into like how people view them with like the alpha dominance theory. Like you need to be the herd leader. If you actually look into herd dynamics scientifically with horses, it's all like emotional and relationship based. Like the horses who get along with most of the other herd and have the best relationships with the best of the herd tend to be the most likely to be able to take on leadership roles because if they leave the herd, others are going to follow them because they're connected to them. So with horses, relationship is what matters most but like people view everything from such a hierarchical concept that we don't consider that and we view it as like oh you need to be the leader when it's like no you need to be their friend if you're their friend and they trust you and they like you like you have way more power than if you're like just the dominant leader like I could boss horses around and I could scare them into submission before, but like, do you want to know how much more powerful I feel like when I can walk into an eight acre field and have six horses come running towards me just because they like me? And like, I couldn't do that when I was bossing them around. But it's interesting because there's way more power in empathy. Like people who respect you because you respect them. And like, I'm going to use the term respect carefully here because people use it in the worst way possible with horses. But when it's actually a true, real, mutual respect and enjoyment of each other's company, they are way more willing to do favors for you, help you out and like participate and be in your bubble than if you're just dominating them and they're responding to fear. And it goes for like people and animals. Like, I have people who are probably, like, intimidated by me and don't like me. And, like, if they feel like I'm coming off as, like, adversarial or blunt, because sometimes, I like, when I'm speaking in scientific terms, it's very blunt. Because when you're writing, like, papers for school, you literally just say it how it is. And that's it. Like, no, there's no emotions involved. There's no, like, worrying about hurting feelings. So sometimes I go about writing stuff online in that mindset forgetting that people aren't necessarily familiar with that and then they're like oh wow you're being like a jerk and it's and then they take it the wrong way but when you have the chance to like connect with people and talk it like in a way where it's like mutual sharing of emotions and like on a more level basis you tend to garner a lot more respect and I think the same is with horses like if you stand there with them and they're like afraid and instead of getting mad because you're inconvenienced by their fear you instead try to help them self-regulate and feel better in the moment they'll start to learn like hey like when I'm scared this person makes me feel safer like what I find interesting in the herd even is like When something really scares the horses, even when they are all out with each other, they usually still come towards me and stand near me and be around my presence, even if all of them are still together. But they want me to be in that circle because they feel safer when I am there. Um, And if I'm not there, then they deal with it and they self-regulate on their own and they're fine. But if I'm around when something scary happens, they go towards me because they're like, oh, this person knows what's going on. Or even if I'm doing something that they should be afraid of, like lighting a massive burn pile, they come over and they watch me because they're like, hey, what's going on? We want to see. And it's made them easier to train because they're so much more curious. But it also makes it safer for me because they're able to self-regulate. Like, 
I think that's one of the most important takeaways with working with horses is what makes them dangerous is one, their size, but two, their flight tendency, because when they're way overstimulated, their brain can literally bypass the thinking portion and go immediately to movement because they have such a highly developed amygdala. So when they're afraid, they can be moving and trying to get away from the danger before their brain actually even processes what they are afraid of. And so teaching them how to self-regulate is actually how you keep them safe and how you keep yourself safe. Because if they can think through the fear, they're not as likely to bypass that thinking portion if they're self-regulating better. And then they're more able, if they do spook, to think about how to get around you and like not just react blindly. Um, Because it's not realistic to just expect them to never spook. They're flight animals. We all spook. Like I jump at, I heard a car backfire the other day and I jumped and I'm a predator, but so so it's interesting because it all kind of comes back down to self-regulation, building relationship and like closeness and trust. And when you do that, you're way safer. And like my experience is just all anecdotal, but I think this will end up starting to come out in studies as well. But when you keep them in a place where they can self-regulate easier and they're not going way over threshold, you're substantially safer. There's already studies that show like the more stressed horses are, the more dangerous they are. So like it's to our own benefit to not stress them out. And it, it's interesting how training is framed in the horse world because it's oftentimes doing the exact opposite. Like let's stress them out a ton first before we get them to stop reacting. And it doesn't make sense in practice. I couldn't agree more. And as a military veteran, I can reflect on that. And it, it seems like a lot of the way that the vast majority of horse training is at least initially taken on is very much militar militaristic, meaning it's, it's kind of like that. Let's flood the horse with a bunch of stressors and somehow get to a point of being able to sort that out. Um, But that doesn't always work. It's like we're always looking for submission. We're always looking for, yeah, submission. Like trust and connection seems to largely be thrown out of the equation, even though that's like, at least in my uh, experience and, you know, talking to various amount of people, trust and connection is at the center of what we want is what we all desire, both the human and the horse. Even if we don't like know it, you know, even, even people that are not directly looking for that and directly training for that. And, you know, whatever, I think that it's just in our, in our nature to desire a connection. We're herd animals. So yeah. Shelby, why do you think that people humans disregard that desire for connection and and love and relationship and go for you know the idea that this horse needs to learn to get yeah. the pressure and, and I think there's a yeah I think there's a few different layers like I think part of it's the fact that like b- like a what like but not anymore but before like when we were training horses we needed them to do tasks like they were work animals we couldn't have built the cities and structures and societies that we have today without horses we couldn't have gone to war without horses so there wasn't room in those circumstances to really care about their feelings and I think In order to make it survivable for the people, they've had to pretend that horses are less emotional and less able to feel pain, etc. than they were able to because you needed to just force them to work anyways because you needed it to get to work, to build your house, to um, plow the fields for your crops. And I think that mindset kind of carries over in today, even though they're no longer really being used as work animals. But I think the other component of it is that, like, the way our society, especially in Western culture, has developed is very individualistic. And whether people realize it or not, like, my personal views on the reason why that is is because it's more profitable. The more you can split people up, get them out of their, like, nuclear family and living alone and feeling the need to provide on their own, live alone, be away from other people, and not develop connections. First of all, they're going to go to work more. They're going to book off less time. They're going to be more focused on that aspect of their life if they're not focused on human connections whatsoever. And also, if you don't have families living together, then everyone's renting out their own places and living alone like it's it's not 
quite that like it, like in other areas it's not like where you hit 18 and you're, the expectation is that you like move out or like where people are embarrassed to still be living with their family past a certain age so i think like we're encouraged to be individualistic in our society and lack connection and also like with animals in particular people will downplay and underestimate the level of emotionality that they're able to feel because then you can justify mistreating them more and it's easier to come to terms with that than it is to look at your horse or your dog or whatever. Like, especially if your horse is living in a less than ideal circumstance, looking at that and going, wow, my horse could be suffering in this lifestyle is really difficult for some people. So they'd rather try to downplay the capacity that the horse has to feel about that and not connect as much. But the thing about connection is that, like, regardless of whether or not you're connecting with, like, a horse or a person, like, you're not always going to be meeting them at their best. Even if you have the best intentions and you try to be the best friend ever and, like, provide as much as you can to the situation, there's going to be situations where you're limited in the resources that you have to help the other side of that friendship. And sometimes the only thing you can do is sit with them with the resources you have and just be a support and be understanding and know why they're feeling the way that they are. And I think that's where horse people get lost because, for example, like not being able to have your horse out in a big group turnout field doesn't mean that you don't you, you can't acknowledge the science showing that that's the healthiest way for them to live. Because even just the act of knowing that they're living in a less than ideal circumstance allows you to be more empathetic and help to make up for any deficits in care. And it doesn't mean that you need to like beat yourself up or guilt them. You can go like, I'm doing the best I can in my situation, but you need to recognize the deficits of the situation that they're in to fully empathize with how it might be impacting them. Because otherwise, if you don't, when you start to get problem behaviors that come out of that, you're more likely to respond with anger and frustration because you're not understanding where it's coming from. So I think a lot of it stems from like how we originally used horses and how that hasn't changed and how like now that they're pleasure animals, we have very much the same type of mindset that we did when they were work animals. But now it's for something that serves no function other than humans pleasure. Like there's no functional purpose for it. We have a so I think we have a responsibility now to do things the better way because it's not like a life or death situation. It's not like horses are playing such pivotal roles in society that if they don't do their jobs, that society is going to collapse. It's not like that. The horse world is highly privileged. Most of the people participating in it at the competitive level are doing pretty well if you compare them to like the average human being and what they're earning and what they're able to afford. So we have a duty now to do better and to be more empathetic and kind and to seek that connection more. And like, I think that if we don't do that, that'll be the undoing of the horse world for sure, because people on the outside see it far more clearly than people who are immediately involved in the horse world. And that's probably been one of the more eye-opening things that I've seen as of late because, like, if you casually bring up, like, a lot of the ways that people subdue and control horses when they're being difficult to, like, the average person, they go, like, what the heck? Like, I had someone ask me about racehorse lip chains, and I was like, yeah, like, it, it's literally a chain against their gums. And they were like, what the heck? And their eyes went all wide, and they were like, that's horrible. Like, how is that legal? And I was like, well, a lot of people don't even think that it hurts them. And they're like, how does that even make sense? Like, they're like, how does anyone believe that that wouldn't hurt an animal? And I was like, I don't know, because of their size or whatever. Like, I, like it, it's, it's such a built-in cognitive dissonance that... Some people are honestly committed to not seeing the truth. And it it's sad because when you're doing that, you can't properly connect with your horse because you're not seeing their behavior for what it is and you're not seeing where they might be suffering. Because part of con it's not just meeting them during the good moments all the time. Like connection is noticing their bad moments and being there to help and support them however you can. But most people only want to feel the good things. It just traces back to our own selfish desires and greed and power and control. I've been around horses now for only half a decade. I've never heard of uh, race chains. Oh, yeah, um, you're lucky. You yeah. Know, and, and, and so I think it's a lot of just out of sight, out of mind. People, if they do get a glimpse of it, well, it's easy to turn a blind eye and just say, well, that's not my problem. Somebody else will take care of it or, or somebody won't or it's just and you mentioned this earlier. It's just so 
individualized. We're, we're conditioned to focus on ourselves, that egocentric nature to where all we are conditioned to concentrate on and focus on is self in the propulsion of our own self that just permeates any sort of interaction we have with ourselves as human beings and other species, including horses. Yeah. One of the things that yeah. comes to mind for me recently that has been brought frontline and center for us is the controversies going on with the wild horse roundups here in America, especially. I would venture to say the vast majority of, of American citizens have to absolutely no clue what's yeah. going on like like just like you mentioned the the race teams you know it's like they don't know that a helicopter is within like feet of horses heads while they're running them miles and miles and miles throughout an open range to get them to yeah run and break their legs and necks into uh you know capture so things yeah. so yeah, and stuff like that's hard, too, because I find that, like, people who do know, they'll make excuses and be like, oh, well, they need to get rounded up because there's lack of food, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, whatever, let's say every excuse in the book is completely accurate. They cannot live on any of the wild lands, and it's strictly for their safety. Still, if they're breaking their necks trying to get out of the roundup pens, is there not a better way that we could approach this? Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, one of my Mustangs, like, during her roundup, a horse tried to jump the six-foot fence and flipped over and broke its neck. And that's not a one-off experience. They've also separated, like, young foals from their dams because they physically cannot keep up with the herd when they're all running for their lives. And there's better ways that they could do it. Like, like, I, like even using like ATVs and stuff would be safer than helicopters. Cause also for the risks to the pilots, I feel like when you're flying that close to the ground, it can't be oh safe. Um, so I yeah, mean, a very rusty one, but uh, not a helicopter pilot, but to see on film, the aircraft damn good pilots, uh, have you, but to, be able to witness the helicopters flying like that to me it's kind of a disgrace to piloting in that regard to use that machine to scare an animal that way and or to, to scare them it's yeah and it's to terrifying them. yeah well and they like still just... react to planes and stuff too because mine i still remember a plane flew overhead when they were shortly here and they both ran and hid under the shelter and i was like oh that's really sad um and they're they're used to it now, which is fine. But like, I don't. I think people. It's also easy when you're not the one experiencing trauma. Like whether it's a horse, another animal, or a person. If you're not the one experiencing the trauma, it's so easy to downplay it and be like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. They'll get over it. And it's like that's not your place to say. Like it's it's the it's the person experiencing the trauma, or the like animal experiencing the trauma whose experience is real. Like it's easy to justify and make up excuses for why something's fine when you're not the one feeling the pain or the trauma or the fear directly and for every mustang that weathers that situation really well because it would depend on where they are in the roundup too with how traumatic it would be like the closer they are to the helicopters the scarier it would be the more split up from the herd they are the scarier it would be if they get split up from really important pair bonds the scarier it would be if they get paired with horses from different herds who are beating the crap out of them in pens the scarier it would be so there's so many different levels to the trauma depending on the experience and i don't think people consider that enough and like it, it's interesting because people's view of like those roundups and stuff like that being necessary they use that to try to silence any discussion on how it could be improved and the thing is it, it could be necessary but it could also still be improved and that's the part with the horse world that I really don't understand because in so many aspects like they don't even want the discussion of improvement to happen if they think that something's necessary they're so scared of discussing welfare improvement that their move is to just silence anyone who's trying to like move towards that direction in discussion which is really unfortunate and like I like people would tell me I can't speak on this enough as someone like who has only gotten like my first two Mustangs and from a behaviorist perspective pulling into the um the like the corrals 
the way those horses are living in the corrals is honestly better than most boarding facilities when you look at it at face value like they all had hay in front of them they had a decent amount of space and they were all out together that's great but when you compare that to the amount of land that they were ranging on and the fact that they would have had families that they had lived with for like however many years depending on how old they were when they were rounded up it's still a pretty big change and it's also pretty clear like especially when you meet ones that are very traumatized that like it the experience took something out of them i think what's interesting about horse trauma is that people almost always attribute like a horse's progress to the trainer in training and they're like oh well if you can't progress fast enough then you're not a good trainer um and this i found particularly interesting because i work with a lot of traumatized horses and usually the people who rush them are the ones that set them back the most especially if their problems are such that they cannot let go of the trauma and then the more you try to push them forward and accelerate training and train faster the more problems you run into and I found that interesting like on this topic of Mustangs because they have these Mustang makeover competitions where you have like a hundred days to get them to comp like from wild to competition and like some trainers I'm sure can do that somewhat ethically but like honestly like as a principal like three months out of the wild to drive like across the country and go to an expo and perform in front of a crowd for a wild animal is such an incredibly huge ask that we shouldn't be framing that as the normal. And like I, I did the retired racehorse project, which is like you have a like like a year basically to train a horse to take it to the makeover. And it's like they're all already broke. So it's interesting to me that in a competition like that where you're using horses that have grown up in captivity or already started under saddle, they have a longer amount of time than these Mustang competitions do. And I think that they've normalized it to such an extent that people view it as like almost like, yeah, necessary to move them along really fast. Or that if you can't, that it's a statement of the trainer's skill rather than the trainer's choice to move at a pace that they feel is fair to the horse. Um, Cause with my Mustangs, I know for a fact, like people would look at what I've done with them. And they'd be like, Oh, you're barely doing anything with them. You've had them six months and you're not even riding them yet. And it's like, well, why would I like, why would I write? Like it's more important to do the basic care necessities and like have them really well and easy to handle with stuff that they need to do. And if they're not comfortable with like all of that and more, why would I try to get on them? Cause it, one, it's endangering myself for absolutely no reason at all when there's no, like I don't need to rush. So why would I? And two, it's not fair to them, especially because like as a Canadian, I had to, um, adopt from the sales strike program so they were in the corrals for longer because they had to go through the sales at least three times in order to just be sold outright rather than adopted so what you also have to consider in that regard is that when they're sales strike horses depending on how long they're in the corrals for they learn that like every time a person's entering the corral it's usually to move them somewhere else so they have like flags and they're moving them from corral to corral and then you're effectively conditioning the idea that like a person approaching means move get away from them don't go near them and then you're creating a behavioral response that is not conducive to training them to like people. And that takes some time to undo. But it's interesting because we we view that the, the horse's time that they take as a commentary on the trainer's skill set and their ability to train instead of like looking at it from the standpoint of like some horses need more time and a truly skilled trainer isn't going to go, I need to be fast before everything else. It's the quality of training that matters. And, like, I train slower now, but, like, the quality is better. My horses have less holes in their training. And people are getting more quality horses. Like, they're going to have a more consistent horse who's less likely to spook, less likely to react. Um, and with my Mustangs, especially since they're wild horses, like, I don't want to ever run the risk where I could sell them to someone and they're going to be, like, explosive and scared because they'll have holes in their training. Like, if they're going to get sold, they're going to get sold as horses who are well adapted to live in the human environment. And that includes desensitizing them to people and, like, making them trust people to such a point that they're not going to react in a dangerous manner or are unlikely to do so and developing that kind of like framework and training takes time when you're working with traumatized horses uh so it, it's interesting to me too how everything's so speed based yeah i couldn't agree more i've even come to dislike the term 
desensitization, it alludes to the idea that we've got to create a stimulus and continue creating that stimulus until the horse ultimately gives into that stimulus. My buddy horse, uh, when he came home, his name's Cody. He was trained to some degree and then he was pretty rusty as far as riding was concerned. And back then, you know, I had the idea really that horses were pretty much like, you know, ATVs, like, like recreational vehicles. I didn't, I didn't see them for what they truly are. Uh, and this was just half a decade ago. We went through a large amount after losing uh, our first horse named Mocha and she, she died, you know, prematurely really. And the changes that ensued as a result of that, I ultimately got off of Cody and didn't ride for, it was upwards around a year uh, that I just spent not riding and really working on that relationship. And so what I'm getting at and to kind of piggyback on your idea about time and horses to me, they don't live in the constructs of time like we do. And I'm really, from my perspective now, is function of a human construct that we are so amped up about. The more I'm able to take off the time clock, and it's taken me a few years to do that consistently, the horses are just, they become so magical. Yeah, no, and and that's how you enjoy it more, too, because I think if you're so focused on the destination, it's hard to enjoy the journey. And then I also think that that bleeds into the entire problem with people viewing horses as very disposable. And like I used to do the same thing where like if I couldn't ride a horse, I wouldn't want to have them anymore. But now that I can look at it with like a more clear mindset, there is no way around admitting the fact that if your horse stops having value to you as an animal when you cannot ride it, that you love riding more than you love the animal. And like, cause like, that's the thing. Like if my dog, for example, got injured and I couldn't walk her and bring her to the barn, I'd be very sad for her because she likes doing it so much. But I wouldn't go, this dog no longer has value to me anymore. I'm going to give her away. And with horses, that's what I would have done. But now, like, if they got injured or something, like, I would still provide them with a home. And I'm lucky that I have, like, a place that, like, I keep them and do self-care and that we have the space. But at the same time, like, I think that's one of the big problems in the industry where horses only hold value when they're rideable and when they're usable and when they're doing something. And if we actually started to have people enjoying the journey of training them and just spending time with them and enjoying the entire process, including the groundwork, that just sitting and hanging out with them, they'd hold more value outside of riding that would allow people to love them even when they're no longer usable for riding. Because as it stands, there's so much wastage and like disposal of horses when they're no longer rideable or when they have problems that people are unable to fix or when they get old and they can no longer be used. And that leads to a lot of mistreatment of those horses that's completely avoidable if people could just learn how to enjoy them in like other capacities. And like, I ride way less now than I used to because, like, when I was working at the racetrack and stuff, I was riding, like, upwards of 20 horses a day. Um, and to be quite honest, like, it robs me of my enjoyment of riding to a large extent. Like, I, I stopped riding and working with my own horses and I was only, like, going out to, like, feed my horses and hang out with them. And it was like a chore. Like I didn't enjoy it because like the horses largely weren't enjoying what I was doing with them. It was just about going and like getting the job done and getting worked and getting like paid and doing stuff like that, which I needed to make a living. So that makes sense. And I wasn't like mean to the horses, but I stopped enjoying riding in the way that I would have because of that. And then after being burnt out from that, I kind of reintroduced myself to working with my horses and did like a lot of groundwork um, and started doing everything from the ground and like went basically this entire winter without riding. 
And I was ridiculed for it by people online. And they're like, oh, well, you don't even ride anymore. Like you're just like a treat trainer and you don't even ride anymore. And it's like there's disrespect towards people and horses when you're not riding. And it's like you guys don't even know why I'm not riding. Like I could be injured. My horses could be injured. And like I got more crap for giving my horse time off to heal and like have the mental and physical reset he needed than I did when I was pushing him too hard and he was clearly stressed. People made fun of me more for giving them the time off and used it as a means of discounting my experience and what I had done when I was doing the right thing. And like during the winter for me, too, it's like I don't have an indoor arena. I don't even have an arena to ride in. And it's like it was cold. It was rainy. It was gross. Like I live on the Pacific Northwest. It either rains all the time year round other than drought season. Or we get snow sometimes where it's suddenly very, very cold. And this winter we had a lot of snow. So I was just going out and hanging out with the horses and feeding them. And I didn't want to ride. So I just didn't force myself to. Because in the past I had for so long and I just didn't want to. Um, And now I'm finally starting to enjoy it again. So like that's great. But the fixation on riding, I think, creates a lot of the welfare problems that we see in horses, too, because so much of what we do for their day-to-day care and management is about keeping them sound for riding and keeping them ready for showing. And then also how we dispose of horses usually relates to whether or not they're rideable. Uh, and you see it a lot in the show world where people are like, oh, like I can't turn my horse out in group turnout because then he could get bite marks or scratches or he could get injured. And there's all of these excuses about keeping horses like pristine and nice for riding because that's where all the priorities are and I think that people are missing out on actually truly getting to know and love their horse like you don't really know your horse that well if all of your time or the vast majority of it is just allocated to riding them you can't get to know them as well when you're engaging in a behavior that by default and in most traditional programs takes away the horse's autonomy you don't get to know what they're really like when you're the one controlling and directing them and telling them where to go all the time like you need to take away the control in order to actually get to know the animal as the being that they are and when you do that and you give them the power to be able to communicate with you and feel heard then they start communicating way more but like I see so many horses and like the saddest thing as a trainer for me when I get really troubled horses is like when they've had no voice and they haven't been listened to they stop trying to communicate they just they're like robotic and they just go through the motions of life and do what they're told and they don't try to influence their environment at all because they haven't had the option to yeah it's like they're just waiting to die yeah that's It's like a depressed state. Like it would be like, I'd say it's probably the same type of like the animalistic state of like severe human depression where you don't even want to get out of bed and like do anything where you're just like sitting there. Yeah. Waiting. And that's part of my personal story of just uh, healing from anxiety and depression, you know, stemming from decades of life on this planet, just not wanting to exist. And I suppose when I started to, understand that within myself uh, I was able to empathize more fully with the horses and we started a mantra early on you know working with the horses after after our kind of shift that we had after Mocha's death and we called it communication not control for us the the two Mustangs that we have they definitely have been through hell to get here but they don't exhibit that. It's like horses don't hold grudges like humans would. Wow, they they've just been able to reciprocate so much love yeah. and, and trust despite their road or path to getting here. They're so forgiving. They're yeah. Just, they're such forgiving beings. <laughs> Yeah, we often don't deserve how forgiving they're willing to be. And like, I like the communication over control mantra because a lot of the horse world will say it's a partnership, but it's actually a dictatorship. And like, I say that as someone who used to be like the dictator, but like, if you're not allowing one half of the partnership to have a voice as soon as their voice is inconvenient to you, then it is not a partnership. It's a relationship of control. And it's really, really hard to let go of that control initially when it's what you've been taught to do and all you've ever known. And like 
part of my journey in doing that, like it honestly, like it was really hard because especially with like Milo, when I started using more positive reinforcement and I was trying to do Liberty work with him, he didn't want to work with me even when I had food rewards. And I wanted so badly to like go catch him and like make him work with me instead of wandering down way, way to the other far side of the arena. Um, but by giving him the autonomy to leave and kind of letting him realize like, hey, I have some say in this, he then started to openly participate more. And like in a sand arena, I couldn't get him to participate even with food rewards. But now I can take him out into grass areas and get him to come do liberty work with me when there's grass all around him that he can eat. Um, and occasionally he'll go and he'll grab a few bites, but he comes back and he'll follow me and like wander with me through the trails and stuff. And like if I couldn't even manage that in a fenced in sand area there's no way I would have been able to do it on grass but letting go of that control is what gave that to me because there's just there's no way he would have had incentive to want to work if he knew he never had a choice and I think it's the same with people like if you're if you're like pressured into doing things all the time and never get the option you stop wanting to do those things yeah I find that with the positive reinforcement training it's not even about the treats it's about the connection that they it's about the connection and the autonomy and the choice that they feel that they have in the training which leads to like i don't know an incredible relationship and yeah writing and playing experience with them They're just yeah i think people yeah, I mean, get fixated on the treats <laughs> Yeah, and there's yeah. there's so much of that, like, oh, they're doing it just for the treats. Well, if they were doing it just for the treats, Willow would have let me ride her, you know, the first day or so that I had her. No, 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 no. It took uh, just over a year for me to start actively or to start riding her. I just now, I mean, like a month ago, started actively riding her. And this horse is like, oh, this is like the best. Like, this horse will come up to me and be like, get on me. We're riding seriously <laughs> and you're you're gonna come and tell me it's all about the treats yeah i'm sorry it just doesn't look like that the, the treat mugging idea just we've never experienced it i think a lot of people don't want to make these changes or they they're reluctant to let go of control because mm -hmm. it's scary yeah it's scary to it's scary to think of not having control and so if you have a perception of control you know, you don't want to let that go. Yeah. And so I can I can see and feel that, but it does, in my mind, always come, at least in the context of a course human relationship, it comes at the expense of not only the relationship, but it comes at the expense of the well being of the horse. Oh, for sure. Like they need autonomy to actually and like also that's like where like for trail riding, for example, like I don't really care when my horses grab like I let them grab bites of grass along the way because it's like if we're here doing this together it doesn't it really doesn't slow me down at all to let you stop for two seconds grab a mouthful of grass and then continue on and it makes them enjoy it better and then it makes it more enjoyable for both of us but the control thing is interesting is it's all like a perceived control like even with the equipment people use like there's so many bits on the market and training gadgets on the market that are all about like making your horse do what you want them to do or getting more control and like even in the harshest bidding rig you can find like it's still an illusion of control you're using the illusion of pain and discomfort to make the horse think that they can't overpower you, but no matter what, they always can. Like they always have the upper hand. And that's what I find so interesting because I've had people tell me, like I got a comment on like my beach riding videos of me riding Milo Bridalist on the beach where they're like, that's dangerous. And I was like, but if I was out there in like a Pelham or something, you would be fine with it. So like, why, why is it suddenly dangerous just because he's in a neck rope? And like, I even like, I turned him loose at one point and we were just walking around because I dropped a pair of my glasses. And he was following me around. They're like, oh, that's dangerous. Like, he could run away. And it's like, well, where is he going to go? Like, his, his his herd is right here. Like, he's he's not like, yeah, he could leave. And if he was a horse that had no connection to me, I wouldn't do that because he could potentially run off and go do whatever he wants. But people are like, they think that the control that they get from the equipment that they use is more powerful than like 
Control's the wrong word for this context, but I guess like the influence that connection brings because like that's the thing is it's like the same thing as like like bringing it back to like parent child relationships. If you have a good relationship with your child, like with the exception of really young ones who have like no impulse control and need their parents to control them for safety purposes, if they're in trouble and they trust you and they know they're not going to get like punished or like ridiculed or whatever. Those kids are the ones that go to their parents for guidance and they go to their parents for help when they need it most. But the kids that are like punished and made to feel like they're going to be in trouble or like they can't trust their parents because when they do confide in them, it ends up resulting in something bad. Those are the kids that are so afraid to tell their parents that they might end up in bad situations because they don't go to that comfort for guidance because it hasn't been a comfortable relationship. Um And, like, obviously horses are way different than people because their cognition is not as complex as ours. But the influence you get from creating a good and safe relationship, I would liken to the herd dynamic where when horses build really strong social bonds, they have certain members of the herd that they will go to for comfort that are, like, their favorite horses to be around. Like, I have a bonded pair of three horses that have been together for four plus years like yeah four plus years now all three of them and it's noticeable because when you remove certain horses from that bonded pair they only get upset sometimes when those horses leave and like they like anyone else could leave you could remove the whole herd other than their bonded pair and they don't care but when their friends leave they're more likely to call for them and they get way more comfort from those particular horses than they do from anyone else and it's because they have a more bonded social relationship um and i've noticed it with like other horses too like um with my mustangs if my mom tries to do the same things that i can do with them they don't always let her because they don't know her as well they don't they haven't built the same level of rapport uh and same thing with milo like he's willing to do things for me that in theory he does not want to do simply because I'm asking him and there's like a conversation where it's like okay we're gonna compromise like it's like you need to go in the trailer for the vet I know you don't like the trailer the trailer is never fun it always sucks but you're gonna get special hay when you go in there you get food rewards every time and then I'm gonna like feed you the whole time you're in the trailer until we leave um and still doesn't like the trailer but he went from rearing up and not wanting to load and like pawing the entire time in the trailer not eating the hay because he was so stressed to immediately going and eating the hay when he loads so that's compromise like I'm not going to expect him to ever like the trailer because he has no real incentive to like being in there more than being out of there but it's a necessary behavior that he's going to need to do on a relatively regular basis. So we compromise. And I I wish more people were willing to kind of have that conversation and compromise because like horses don't want to cause problems. Like they really don't, they don't, they want to choose the path of least resistance. So when you see horses applying heavy, heavy resistance, there's usually a reason behind it because like they, they don't want to do that. They don't want to expend energy unnecessarily just freaking out for no reason. So it's just about motivating them in a way that they understand and compromising because like that's the thing is like I view food rewards as compromise in training. Like even outside of like using them to reinforce. I know that one, horses are trickle feeding herd animals and they need to be eating on a near constant basis. So it's the perfect way to help ensure that their tummies are full and that they're feeling good. And two, I'm asking them to do things that are unnatural and outside of like their behavioral ethogram of what is normal for them. So if I'm going to do that, I need to incentivize them in a way that they understand that they'd like. And all animals understand food, like all animals that consume food are motivated by food and they understand that they need it and they like it. And so it's arguably the best motivator because if you look at it from the biological perspective of what they are as animals yes they're also highly motivated to escape discomfort but it's in a in an evasive way like you don't they don't want to seek discomfort so it's in my opinion more powerful to engage that seeking system and have them want to defer to finding solutions finding answers and understanding that they can manipulate their environment because they learn how to communicate better and like I, I'm of the like I have to be careful how much I say these things because there's not enough evidence to actually substantiate the beliefs that I have in terms of the cognitive capacities of animals. But like I think that we've only touched like the tip of the iceberg with like how smart horses actually are because like there's things that I've noticed that 
are inexplicable from the standpoint of there's not enough studies for me to openly prove it. But like, for example, one time I went in the field and Milo was like hanging around and was like pestering me and like constantly putting his head on top of my head. And even if I sat on the ground, he'd bring his head right down low and then he'd put his head on my head and like nudge me, nudge me, nudge me, wouldn't leave me alone. And then I noticed that he got stung by a bee underneath his jaw and he was putting his head on top of my head repeatedly to like show me where he was uncomfortable and then as soon as I noticed and started like scratching it he stopped doing it and he's like okay cool you 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 figured out what I was trying to tell you um so I think we vastly underestimate all the ways that our animals will try to communicate with us and when we don't listen to them we teach them that there's no point in trying to communicate and then we take that lack of communication as a lack of intelligence and a lack of ability to communicate instead of a learned behavior by them not being able to manipulate their environment and that's why positive reinforcement is so great because you're teaching them how to manipulate the environment. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I don't have to be careful about what I say. And I'm going to go ahead and just piggyback on it and, and say, um, as human beings, we grossly, grossly, grossly underestimate our own in individual and collective powers that we have within us and that we can actually bring to the table collectively as a human species. And when it comes to horses, uh, you mentioned earlier that they, you know, science might say that they have lesser of a cognitive abil ability. And from a neuroscience perspective, that would point to perhaps their smaller uh, frontal cortex. But it's been my personal experience in many, many different forms and fashions, just working with a handful of horses, they have a much more distinct operational connection to the spectrum of things that we as humans in our current evolution are unable or unwilling, rather, to see from much more of like, say, a spiritual perspective that ultimately pulls into the, the physical realm and so uh, oh i agree they, so much i highly yeah. believe that they have so so much more to teach us have you yourself been through any sort of spiritual practice or um yeah like in a way yes like i would say like like i i recently read gabor Matei's the myth of normal and like he it, he's a world-renowned psychiatrist that's canadian from British Columbia, where I live, um, and is an addiction specialist and trauma specialist. And I was reading some of like his studies and his musings on um, like his mental health and his belief system. And he was talking about how interconnected like the world is and like how trauma is actually a driving force behind a lot of the physical ailments that we see in people. Um, and my my viewpoint of that is like any creature with a nervous system that's likely applicable to. So I think that we have trauma memories and we hold on to things, whether like, or not even memories, but like, like bodily memories, whether your brain remembers them or not, that we hold on to that cause us to behave a certain way. And we ignore, first of all, our intuition and like our internal feelings about the world around us. And we don't connect with like, mother nature and the like, spirituality around it like I like I don't necessarily believe in like a god or anything like that per se but like I think that mother nature governs the whole world and like there's an interconnectedness to the entire world where everything in theory if it was working where we weren't destroying the environment everything kind of feeds into everything and there's interconnectedness of everything um and horses, since they live in the present and they don't have the same ability to recall past things at will or muse off into the future as we do, I think that animals like that are, like, by default, more in interconnected with the world because they have to be. Like, they're, they're living in the moment so in-depth in ways that people can't because our brains are always wandering off and doing other things. Um, so from, like, a spirituality perspective, like, I think that a lot of the stuff that people view as woo-woo is only like that because the money and time hasn't really been put into um, exploring that as deeply. And 
it's really interesting the further you go into like trauma psychology and the research on that and how connected with like physical health it is um and like what i found particularly interesting about that book is that he talks about people who've developed autoimmune diseases and cancer and how they like he had certain clients who were terminal and they were able to reverse their cancer without treatment simply by like their like the way that they went about their life and just man of like he had one client that had terminal cervical cancer and they said that if she doesn't get her entire like uterus removed etc that she's not gonna live and she's like i don't want to i want to have another baby i'm not gonna do that and the doctors were like you're so stupid this isn't gonna work um and she reversed it and has been in remission and then had another baby after even though they told her that she never could because um of the damage that she would have had to her reproductive system. And it was all because in her head, she's like, I don't have cancer. Like, she's like, I'm going to go about doing this thing my way. And she's like, I'm not going to have cancer. It's going to get cured. And she manifested it without changing anything or doing any chemo. And he told a bunch of different stories about people with problems like that. And obviously not every person is going to have the capacity to do that. But even just the fact that there are any cases that people can use to show people reversing autoimmune disorders or cancers in ways that we have been told are not possible to do, I think speaks for something that we need to put more time and energy into researching. Because what I found interesting is that having like a doctor look at that and go and he, he asked her, he's like, did did your doctors that were working your case, like the oncology doctors, did they... um ask you how you did this did they ask for any further information she's like no like I, I've been sending like the one that told her she was going to die like a postcard every Christmas for like the last decade and he never answers and that's interesting to me too because it's like you're you're watching before your eyes your belief system in the medical institute be disrupted by someone managing to do something that seems impossible but then there's no curiosity to explore that further and figure out why it is the same thing that we're talking about in the in the horse human world for a lot of medical practitioners and I've, I've heard a number of them talk about it uh, actual medical doctors talk about it on various podcasts about the the medical industry in and of itself living in that hierarchical sort of we know the way and if we don't we're not going to come out and say that we don't know the yeah. way because we know the way and if we don't, it deflates our entire existence as far yeah. as our profession and, and what and we're profit. Not to say every correct, yeah, and, and, and profit. Yeah. So it, it it's really tied to that greed. Yeah. And so since you since you brought up the topic of cancer, so I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia back in 2017. Now, this was a year before horses entered my life. The series of events since that diagnosis and subsequently working with horses, suffice it to say that I, I went through a period of time where I literally was kind of given in to the idea that this cancer resides in my body and I'm dying. And so I'm a walking dead man to not so long ago, quite recently, actually, having a shift of thinking and being to where I was able to actually like love myself and ultimately feeling like cancer is being eradicated out of my body as we speak, having some of the science, the blood tests to support that. Recently, we were interviewed for a new film that's coming out called Rescued Hearts, which it, which the filmmakers are documenting the healing power of horses. They brought up a book. Uh, they actually gifted us a book called Dying to Be Me by Anita Morjani. Since he brought all that up, that might be a, a yeah. book to check out. No, that's interesting that you say that too, because the acceptance aspect of it was like a important part of the healing process is like accepting your current state and just like giving in to like the way of the world um, and the way that like letting things unfold as they may. That was like an important part of these people's healing process is just accepting the way things were. Um, and I find it so interesting because like I think that logically i see that there's immense motive for media outlets and people who serve to profit the most in the medical institute to not disclose that information on a wide basis because it would render 
aspects of the pharmaceutical industry obsolete if people actually started putting enough research into that and it was found to be plausible and viable for people to enact their own healing process because then you can't sell them drugs and stuff and it's like the same type of idea with like mental health issues like depression anxiety and stuff like medication can be wonderful and amazing like I'm on ADHD medication and it helps me do things um but it can also be a crutch like if you're using it to cover up the symptoms of a problem that can otherwise be addressed then it can be it can be problematic because all it's doing is dealing with the symptoms it's not dealing with the underlying cause from the spirituality aspect, I think that's where we're missing out. Like we don't, we're not connecting with ourselves as like beings of like energy and stuff. Like we view people as just being like bodies and stuff, but it's like, you're not actually like your body is just like a vessel for like your true essence. And it's like the same thing with like horses and other animals. Like what they actually are is beyond what we can see and comprehend. Like we, we don't yet really have any type of inkling of like fully how the brain even works or like where our energy comes from and like where it goes when, when it leaves us, et cetera. Like, there's things that we cannot yet explain. And what I find so interesting about people is we can look back like 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago and we can go look at how stupid people were back then and all these silly things that they believed to be true. But then we can't look in the present and go, wait a second, we are probably doing that right now. And in another 20, 30 years from now, we're going to look back and go, wow, we were so silly and stupid for believing these things. But we're so stubborn in the moment that we actually disrupt the ability to grow and learn more and like develop different ways of thinking because we shame people out of having divergent views and make them feel like silly for saying it. Like, um, for like, like even just talking about like intuition, um, like spirituality, et cetera, like people will make fun of you for that. Cause it's viewed as like what you said, woo woo. Um, but there actually is some merit to it. If you look into like studies and research on the human body and like the amazing feats that people have miraculously been able to accomplish and just because it hasn't been replicated enough doesn't mean that there's nothing there to look into um and it's interesting to me like how resistant to change we are and how much we cling to tradition even when we have the capacity to look back and go these are mistakes we made when we were clinging to tradition and I think it'll be interesting to see how things continue to progress, especially with the big changes that are coming to the horse world, because I do think that learning how to go about handling horses in a different way is going to help people who may otherwise not be willing to connect with themselves in a way that they haven't yet and then connect with that spiritual aspect because like... Like I like I've I've always been really connected to animals because they're honest. They tell you how they're feeling. They don't lie. They don't judge. They don't have status. They just see you for who you are and how how you treat them and they like you because of that. People aren't always so simple um because there's way more factors in. Like some people are and that's fantastic and I those are my type of people. But people you can't trust as easily. Like with horses, they're unpredictable animals, but I can trust them to be predictable in their unpredictability. Like I they, they tell you when something's about to happen. Like I look like when they look off into the distance, they're hyper fixating at something or they see something. I look and I'm like, "Oh, what do you see?" And it's causes me to interact with the environment differently than how I would if it was just me there because I'm being more connected to it in the way that they are. Um, and yeah, like I, I hope we progress as a society to the point where people can heal through like truly getting to know themselves because like when I was the angriest, most abusive person to my horses, it was because I did not truly know myself and like I didn't know, I, like I was behaving and doing things in a way that I thought other people would like and that I thought would garner me respect and like make other people like me, but it wasn't actually like what I wanted to do. And at the time that I was doing that, I wasn't aware that it wasn't what I wanted to do because I was so pressured and controlled by the ideas of other people that I thought that it was what I wanted. And now that I've been able to kind of let go of that, the amount that it's reduced my anxiety, depression, and has helped me kind of find myself has been so important um and yeah that, that's something that I really hope to see people address too because like we we suppress all of the emotions that make us feel uncomfortable and then 
it doesn't allow us to actually process and heal them. And like, I'm guilty of doing this too. I don't like feeling really sad. So like, I try to cling to comfortable things, even in situations where I'm being treated in a way that makes me sad and I shouldn't enable it. Um, But the act of like leaving that situation can be so scary that you choose to continue being sad. Um, And it's been a learning process of like boundaries and whatnot for me too. But like going through that healing process has taught me that like, even when you're feeling really, really bad, if you just feel it and see it through, you feel better after. And there's like, there's life on the other side of that, even if it doesn't feel like that during the moment of like the darkest times that you're feeling emotionally, there's always space on the other side of that. And I think that's really beautiful, even if it sucks to have to like sink down to like rock bottom level sadness to get to that point, because it's empowering. It shows you what you're capable of overcoming and that like regardless of what happens you can come home to yourself um and you'll always have yourself so if you are yourself your authentic self you feel good about yourself and you know that you can overcome feeling really sad you always have yourself to come back to and you can always count on yourself to be there uh, unlike with other people or other environments which i think is awesome and boy don't the horses really help us with that process oh yeah i don't think i could have done it without them because like it's it's really forced me to kind of be more conscious of like everything that's going on in the environment and how it compiles to create certain situations so can i ask you what is your favorite way to reinforce your horse I like doing food rewards. Like sometimes I'll use scratch. Like it depends on the horse. If they're really, really tactile, there's situations where I just like using scratches because then I don't have to carry anything on me. And like when I'm wandering through the field and I'm just hanging out with them, I'm usually not wandering through with tons of food. I just like scratch them and I hang out with them. Um, And we just enjoy that. But for training, I find food to be the most powerful and like the amount of positive change that I've been able to make in my horses using food has been insane. Like they're, they're, with pressure and release, you can't reinforce the exact moment of what you are looking for in the same way with that amount of clarity. And that's what I like so much about food rewards. Well, yeah. Shelby, we've talked about a ton and this has been a great conversation. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It was so interesting. Well, yeah, thank you again. That was like fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. So one thing that I should plug really quickly is that I just co-founded an equine welfare organization called the Alliance for Horse Welfare and Sport. We have a really bold um, we have a really bold goal of getting a million signatures on our petition. We have created 46 welfare recommendations that are evidence based for um, presenting to the FEI leading up to the 2024 Paris Olympics because the Tokyo Olympics painted horse sports in such a bad light. Light. So our goal is to make the 2024 Olympics the Horse Welfare Olympics and show how committed to improving horse welfare the horse industry is. Uh, the 46 recommendations are available to view on all of our platforms. You can look up the Alliance for Horse Welfare and Sport on Facebook. We're Unite for Horses on Instagram or Alliance for Horse Welfare on TikTok. And if any, if if people go to any of my personal pages, which I'll plug in a second, they can also find all of the links to that. But there's a change.org petition that we're looking for signatures on and we're looking to reach all different types of industries and platforms outside of the horse world because we'll need as many voices as possible to try to incentivize the FEI to take us seriously. Um, But the end goal is to mandate better welfare practices in sport and start to no longer enable and allow equipment types and treatment types of horses that just damage welfare um, nonsensically and just start to move towards a higher standard of welfare and start to mandate that as an expectation for people in sport, especially at the pinnacle of the sport, like the Olympics. That's where we should be seeing the best welfare practices. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily happening. There's some really, really great Olympic level riders that do right by their horses and are fantastic. But there's also a lot of problematic things that are still enabled everywhere in the horse industry that are not being appropriately dealt with by the FEI. So basically, our goal is to have them actually like substantiate how they are um, measuring welfare because their rule book and whatnot says that welfare is paramount but they're not actually defining like how they are defining good and bad welfare Um, and 
our belief is that they should be using scientific evidence in order to do that because that's the most unbiased way to to put forth those recommendations. So anyways, all the welfare recommendations are evidence-based and we have some pretty cool, prevalent, very well-educated people on the panel for this organization that are helping push these changes. So you can check all of that out on like my pages or any of the aforementioned pages. And then you can find me and my content on Instagram. I'm SD Equus, S-D-E-Q-U-U-S on Instagram and TikTok. I have a website called milestoneequestrian.ca. Um, I also have a Patreon that's full of like tutorials and behind the scenes stuff. It's patreon.com slash SD Equus. I'm on Facebook as Milestone Equestrian. And um, yeah, you can find me at all those pages. And on all of those pages, I'll have links to the Alliance for Horse Welfare and Sport. But also if you Google that and Google the petition, it should come up as well. Um, But that's really the next big project that I have because the Olympics are coming up fast. And we're going to need to kind of put a lot of traction in this campaign to try to make needed change and whether or not the recommendations are adopted quickly enough for the 2024 olympics our hope is that they will be adopted in the future to help improve horse welfare and sport thank well, you so thank much you for having so me much for your time. yeah it's been yeah. great